Okay, so in this video we're going to be investigating the results we got from the experiment last week and look at um, the graphs that we should end up with for this experiment. So we can, we can see and compare it to your own and see how that went. So firstly, just a quick reminder about what we did. So we had um, a bottle, or two bottles actually, and what we did is we changed the depth of water inside the bottle and we measured the height of the top of the bottle above the ground at the point where it just topples over. So you keep tipping and tipping and tipping the bottle until you get to a point where it actually falls over and we measured this height for that particular bottle. And so we were interested in how the depth of water affected this height that we've got here. And because we used two different bottles for this, and we didn't want the bottle height to be a factor in this experiment, we plotted h over l, so the height as a fraction of the overall length, um, so that we can use several different types of bottles and that doesn't matter. So that's our experiment, and we end up with an h over l versus d graph. So d being the depth of water, h being the height of the top when it topples, and l being the whole length of the bottle. So. Let's have a look at the results that we got as a class. So um, when we did this, people got lots of different graphs. So people got genuinely different results when they did this experiment. And I think it's interesting to explore why that was. Um, so we got graphs where we just had a line, um, straight line with a positive gradient, a bit like this one. We got Some people got this kind of U-shaped graph. So it went down and then it came back up. And some people just got a graph where it went down the whole time. So the question is, which one of these is actually correct? And the answer is all of them. And the simple reason being, well, that's the data you collected. So that must be the correct graph. That would be the first thing. Uh, but we're actually going to compare it to what a theoretical model would say this would look like. Uh, so we can show why all of these graphs are actually correct. The one little thing I would pick up about these graphs, which I saw in quite a lot of them, is you'll see here on the y-axis, a few people have said that um, this, this, remember, is h over l. So h is measured in centimeters. And then we've got, we divided it by l, which is also measured in centimeters. And these units cancel out. So we end up with something that we call a you should be unitless. So there should actually be no unit on this y-axis because we've got h of l. So you can see that's been done correctly on this one up here at the top, uh, but these ones at the bottom, we shouldn't have a unit there. So let's have a look at what the theoretical graph for a bottle should look like. So uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about where this theory has come from in a minute, but I just want to show you what mine ends up looking like. So you can see we've actually got all of the features we've just seen. So we've got a section where we've clearly got a negative gradient. So you can see this one uh, would definitely fit with part of this graph. We can see we've got a section with a long straight positive gradient. So we can see that that one matches up with this graph too. And we can see that on this graph, we've got a point where it goes down and then comes back up. So we can see it matches with this graph as well. So depending on the type of bottle you were using, um, so depending on your bottle shape, this point here will move around. So for some of you, this point would have been very far to the left, which is why you think it was just this one. Some of you, this point would have been quite far to the right, which is why you think it's just a one going down. And some of you have got some data either side of that. So essentially all of those graphs were actually correct. So what I want to explore a little bit is um, essentially where this graph comes from, so why it looks like this. And to do that, we have to look at something called the center of mass of an object. So um, for an object that is solid and made of one material, and we've got a nice regular shape like this, the center of mass is pretty much bang in the middle of the object. Uh, so if you were trying to find your center of mass as a human, it's about in your stomach kind of region. That's where our center of mass is typically. So it's about the middle of an object. So there's roughly equal mass on either side. So you can see here where this one is, there's about the same mass below and above, and there's about the same mass left and right. There is a little bit more to center of mass than that. So it's not quite equal mass above and below, but it's a good general idea of what it is. So, 
Um, we were looking at the point when an object will topple over. So the, the reason we're interested in center of mass is something will topple over if the center of mass goes outside the object's base. So if we have an object that's just sitting down here, you can see its center of mass is over its base and it won't topple over. If we lift it up just a little way, we can see the center of mass is still directly over the base. So that's why I've drawn this line here. So you can see the center of mass is over the base and that won't topple either. What will happen is it will just fall back to this position over here on the left. If we tip it far enough though, its center of mass can go outside the base. So you can see this line is now outside the base and this will fall over. So that's what is happening when your bottle falls over. Your center of mass has gone outside your base. And this is why when you're playing sports and things like that, um, especially ones which sort of involve some um, degree of um, fighting or so with an so if you're doing something like wrestling, if you're doing something like jujitsu, if you're doing something like rugby, you actually start talking about bases and center of masses quite a lot. And this is why we squat down low and have our feet wide. Having your feet wide makes your base really big, which makes it hard to topple you over. Squatting down brings your center of mass lower. So again, that makes you harder to topple over. So that's why um, this becomes quite a re relevant thing. So let's go back to our bottle. So when your bottle is empty, the center of mass is roughly in the middle of your bottle. Okay, and that will give you a certain height at which it'll topple over. Okay, so that, that's, that's with a depth of water of zero, the center of mass is roughly in the middle. That will give us a certain value of H. If you add a very small amount of water, what that actually does is shift the center of mass downwards because water is a lot more dense than the bottle is. So you have a lot of mass down here. And actually that means the center of mass is somewhere down here. So the, the mass above that center of mass and below will be about the same. So that's the center of mass is actually shifted down. And that will give you a different value of H. Uh, your value of H will actually be a lot smaller here because you have to tip it a lot further to make this one topple over. Okay, so that's what's going on when we add a small amount of water. We get smaller values of H typically. And then when the, as we increase the amount of water from there, the center of mass starts to creep upwards, which gives us bigger values of H in order for it to topple over. So the value of H is getting bigger. And so that's what's going on here. So when we add small amounts of water, we bring the center of mass down. So that's what's going on in this part of the graph. And then we reach a point where actually, as we add more water, the center of mass starts to come back up. And that's why we get this particular shape. And you can't actually get Excel to draw this graph because there isn't an equation which models this. There's an equation that describes this downward section and there's an equation that describe, describes this upward section. But actually, we can't draw one line of best fit for this. So you can see I've actually used a pen to draw this on um, here. So when we're doing this experiment, we have to be really careful at choosing our depths of water. So you can see that if your first data point was a four centimeter depth, you'd have missed this entire section over here on the left hand side. Because if this was your first data point here at four, you'd have just got this straight line section up. If you only had small values of D, you'd have only got this section over here on the left hand side. But if you have a good range of Ds, you can see you can see the whole relationship going on here. So this experiment is a really nice illustration about choosing very carefully your values of D and coming back later on to explore what's going on. So when I first did this experiment, I went up in four. So when I first did this, I had this data point. Here, I had this data point, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So you can see, to start with, I got this point up here, and then I just had these points going upwards. And I was like, hmm, seems like something's going on in here that I don't have enough data. So then I came back later on and took these data points here because I wanted to explore what was going on in this section here. And so it's a nice example that, that when you've collected data and plot a graph, that doesn't mean you've finished collecting data. You might need to come back and collect some more data. And this is why it's nice to use Excel so we can come back and add more data in 
later on. Um, so that's just a brief overview of what was going on with our experiment and an an, 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 a brief explanation of why we got these very strange shaped graphs and how we can think about collecting data. Uh, so that's what we had going on with our experiment there.